Hey, Integrity Church, thank you again for joining us on our live stream. And this is really what we can anticipate for the coming weeks. And we're really uh, unsure of when we'd be able to gather again, but we're hoping and praying that it will be soon as we all uh, miss one another. I want to give you some hope today that we can have in the Word of God. The Bible tells us in Psalm 131, it says, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy my, myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child uh, with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. What the psalmist is challenging himself to do is to really take care of his soul. And so right now, times are perhaps hectic in our minds, but slower in our lives. And it's important that we really pay attention to what's going on in our hearts. What is it that we really need from the Lord today? Uh, what is it that we may, maybe need from someone else? And so it's my hope that you would maybe perhaps share an, a need that you have uh, with the Father, with, with our God. And maybe it's a fear or a burden, or uh, maybe it's just a frustration that you have even during this season. Would you perhaps share that with the Lord? Or maybe today it's just with uh, a friend. Maybe you just need to call and say, man, I need some encouragement. I need some wisdom. I need some hope today. And maybe perhaps you would reach out to someone today uh, after this service and, and just make a phone call uh, to a friend or a loved one uh, to get that hope and to make sure that you're paying attention uh, to your soul. Now, if you have needs, we want to be able to serve you and come alongside of you. If you go to our website at liveintegrity.org, you can go to our COVID-19 uh, page, and from there, you can let us know if you have needs. There's a, there's a form located on that page where you can fill it out and let us know what needs that you have. If you're a member of Integrity Church, please let us know those needs, and we would love to just come alongside of you. Our elders would love to pray for you. If there's ways that we can provide counsel or wisdom or just encouragement in this time or any kind of other needs that you want to make known, uh, please make them known to us as we uh, want to care for you in this season. Also, there's ways that you can meet the uh, needs of our city. As our city, the people around us, our neighbors are, are in uh, in turmoil right now, perhaps businesses or uh, people that maybe can't have access to, to food or, or comfort. Um, my hope is that we would be the church in this season. And so here's some ways that you can meet some of those needs. Well, good morning, Integrity Church. We just want to say that we really miss gathering with you as a church. And uh, as this season is upon us with COVID-19 and the quarantine that we're all in and facing, uh, there are a number of needs that have come up in the community. And we as a church want to be the hands and feet of Jesus to continue to meet needs wherever we can. And so I just want to share with you a few of those ways that we can help our community. One of the ways is by partnering with the Ronald McDonald House. They uh, have people staying there um, that uh, have family members that are at Vidant right now, and they are in need of uh, just meals like easy mac and cheese or granola bars or just regular household items like paper towels or uh, cleaning things. And so we just want to uh, be able to come alongside of them and just provide some relief for these families while they're there and they can't get out um, as often as they have family members who are sick. And so there's another way that you can serve and that's by partnering with a local company called Simple and Sentimental. They are making face shields for all of the medical profession and delivering those to them. Um, it's a donation of $8 and they are making it, they'll, they'll send a shield to healthcare professionals. And so um, that is another way that you can help our community. Um, and there's one other way that you can help, and that's by partnering with Community Crossroads. It's our local shelter. They have about 30 to 35 people who are staying there, whereas normally they would 
uh, have breakfast in the morning and then leave and then come back at night and have dinner, um, they now have to provide lunches for the people. And so there are some weeks that they are in need of people providing lunches for the people that are occupying the shelter. And so if you have any interest in serving that, them in this way or any of the other ways that we've mentioned here this morning, I'd love for you just to go on our website, find out more information about it. It's on our COVID-19 tab. And we would just love to be the church while we're yet in quarantine and to help in the safest way possible. And also church, I just wanna encourage you, don't forget to continue to pray for those who are sick, those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, and even for those who uh, are quarantined and unable to get out. And if you know of any other opportunities that we can help as a church, please let us know. We would love to hear from you and we miss you all so much, and we hope to see you soon. All right, thanks so much, Josh. Again, church, let us be the church in this season. Let us really care for one another. Let us care for our own souls, and let us be aware of the needs that are around us. Before we jump into Mark's gospel, I do have two quick announcements for you. Uh, first of all, next Sunday, we're going to gather again as we're scattered, and we're going to be the church and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to do that again through our live stream platforms at 10 a.m. And I want to encourage you to continue to let people know as you're logging in on Facebook, as you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, that you would also help us by sharing and reposting uh, our live stream platform so that the, the, the people around you can, can hear the good news and the hope that we have in Christ. The second thing I want to mention is after this series, after the Gospel of Mark, because of course we're ending the Gospel of Mark on Easter Sunday with the resurrection of Christ, uh, we're going to jump into a new series, and it's going to be in 2 Peter, and ironically we're calling the series Scattered Church. And it's going to help us understand what it means uh, to be, uh, as we even are today, a scattered church with the hope that we have in Christ. But before we jump into Mark's gospel, uh, let me pray for us. Father, we are so grateful for the time that we do have together uh, to worship you. I pray, Lord, that we would claim what our needs are to you and that, Lord, you would help us and you would meet us uh, in our weaknesses, in our suffering. Uh, maybe perhaps we need to call a friend and, and just share what we need. Uh, maybe for some of us, we uh, need to think about others in this season and think about how we can serve and care uh, for their neighbors and our friends. And so help us to do that. Help us to really be the church. Uh, Lord, as we dive into your word, uh, your word helps us today understand what it means to, to be removed from the darkness and to really walk as children of light. So may we do that now in this season, in this time that we have together. It's in Christ's precious name. Satan tempts me to despair 
our great high priest. He is risen and then he is interceding on our behalf. God, we thank you for his work on the cross. We thank you that he took our place and that he died so that we would not have to, but we might be able to enter into your kingdom. God, we're thankful for that truth. We're thankful for the cross pray that it would change us today as we remember your gospel, as we remember your suffering, as we remember that you took our place. Now we ask for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mark 15 verses 33 through 39 is where we'll be this morning. In the early 1900s, there was a well-known ship called the Endurance. And its captain was a man named Ernest Shackleton. Shackleton on the Endurance had a crew of about 30 people. And he was on this voyage where he was trying to travel around the North Pole. And as you know, the North Pole is, is freezing cold. And he's trying to 
go through this expedition and eventually the sea begins to freeze over and forcing the endurance to push through uh, giant blocks of ice, very dangerous, and eventually the blocks of ice, the, the, the sea becoming frozen became too much for the endurance to bear and it was eventually crushed by the ice, uh, forcing Shackleton and his 30 or so crew members off the ship and trying to survive then on the ice to get back to shore. And they were trying to do this through by means of dog sleds, of, of all things. Every single night, they'd have to camp out on this ice. And they would try to gather food. They would try to sleep. They would try to endure uh, the freezing cold. And Shackleton and m- many of his men did survive. But Shackleton later on wrote about this horrific time for he and his crew members as they were shipwrecked. And you would imagine the different sort of struggles you would have. You, maybe perhaps if you would talk about the, uh, th- it being freezing cold, perhaps you would talk about starvation, and perhaps you would talk about losing the lives of your crew members. But Shackleton, as he writes, he says the most difficult thing during that time wasn't any of those things. The most difficult thing was actually the darkness. Uh, around the South Pole at, at this time, uh, the sun would go down around May, and it wouldn't rise up again until July. So every day, every night, Shackleton is there with his crew trying to survive in utter darkness. Now try to imagine that. Perhaps you've been in, in a room that is completely dark, so dark that you can't even see your face if you put it in front of you. That sort of darkness can be utterly terrifying. Without light, we really have no or little control. And this is why the Bible uses darkness as a metaphor. It uses it as a metaphor for really uh, the condition of our hearts without Christ. Without Christ, we are in total darkness. Spiritually, if we are in the darkness, we cannot see in front of us. We, we can't see where we're going. We can't see around us. We can't know who to trust or who to love or how to receive love or how to love. We can't see behind us if we're in the darkness. We can't make sense of our past or what has taken place in our lives. We have very little hope. And so this is why the, the Bible uses darkness as this metaphor of hopelessness. This is really who we were uh, without Christ. This is who we are uh, without Christ. And so today, uh, what we're going to see is is how the death of Jesus Christ allows us to overcome the darkness. Mark 15 is perhaps the most familiar chapter in the Gospel of Mark. It's the, the famous place where Jesus was crucified. This is Mark's account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, where Jesus was tried, Jesus was beaten, Jesus was eventually nailed to the cross. And then Mark takes us into the most chilling scenes of Jesus' death, where we see that even in, in the darkness, though, there's light. And so we'll pick up Mark 15, and we'll start in verse 33. It says, as Jesus was crucified, it says that it was the sixth hour had come, There was, there's the word, darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, the hours here are important. Uh, You see, Mark is showing us that Jesus went to the cross around the sixth hour until he breathed his last breath in the ninth hour. Uh, This would have been between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. And this is sort of a strange thing that happens because during 12 and 3, you normally don't see darkness. But Mark says there was darkness that covered the whole land. Three hours of time. How odd would this be? It it couldn't have been a sandstorm that caused this or some sort of eclipse that caused this. Especially during this time, it would have been full moon. Uh, During the season of the Passover, it wouldn't have been a a, a time where an eclipse would have taken place and caused this darkness. Rather, God is really using his power uh, to, to illustrate something really important for all of us to see. 
And so what, what I want you to see is this is not the first time that God has actually done this to show the condition of our hearts, to really use uh, physical darkness to really show us uh, spiritual darkness. If you think back to the very first Passover, uh, this is earlier in, in God's word in the book of Exodus, when we see God bringing his people out of exile. And during this Passover, God actually shows a scene where there's darkness. And this is where God goes to the strongest leader in the region, Pharaoh, through Moses. He tells Moses, he tells Pharaoh through Moses to let his people go. But Pharaoh was arrogant, he was proud, and he refused. And so God sent a series of the plagues, 10 to be exact, to force Pharaoh to, to let his people go. Now, I won't get into all the plagues, but most of them were painful or just annoying. For instance, water was turned to blood. That was one of them. There was frogs all over the land. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where there's hundreds of frogs or just the sound um, of that many frogs or just the grossness of frogs everywhere. Th that was one of them. There would be hail uh, from the sky. There was locust, uh, just to name a few. But then there was the ninth plague, in the ninth plague, God is telling Pharaoh, In, unless you send my people, God, I'm going to send another one. I'm going to send another one. I'm going to send another one. And Pharaoh, again, he refused. And so finally, the ninth plague was darkness. Utter darkness everywhere that you go. Again, this is before electricity. So you can imagine this darkness. And it was not for three hours like Jesus on the cross, but this was actually darkness for three days. It's interesting that the number three, how many times it's mentioned uh, throughout the Bible, but this is one of the times. Uh, three, three days of complete darkness, and Pharaoh still did not repent. He still did not give in to God's demands, and so what happens is a tenth plague, and the tenth plague was the death of every firstborn in the land. Now, you Think about the similarities here between this first Passover and then this final or this Passover here with Christ on the cross. What, what do we see as the similarities? Well, first of all, we see the darkness here at the cross. God is announcing his firstborn, his one and only son, the true, truer and better Passover lamb that would now die for the sins of the world. Just like the plague in, plagues in Egypt, this was also a warning uh, to repent. And if there is no repentance, there is no freedom and there is no light. You will remain in the darkness and you will die. And so as the same, it's a warning here in the plagues of Egypt. It's a warning here uh, in this day and time now. When we see the darkness cover the, the whole land, as Mark says, as Jesus goes to the cross, he's saying, this is a warning now. Uh, to repent and to trust this Passover lamb, the firstborn of God, that we would trust him and that we would know him and we would be set free. The last thing, the final thing that Mark's showing us here is that what Jesus, Jesus did this. Jesus went into darkness so that we wouldn't live in darkness and face death ourselves. I'm going to show you why that is in verse 34. It says, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lima, Shabbatoni, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put on a reed and gave it to him saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus here makes this famous statement from the cross. He says, God, why have you forsaken me? 
And the way it actually sounds in Hebrew, it actually, the, the, the word Eloi, it actually sounds like uh, Elijah. And so some of the bystanders thought that he was crying out to Elijah, and then they used this opportunity to say, oh, this, he's, calling, he's trying to call Elijah down to, to save him, and they use this as another way to mock Jesus. And of course, this is their own darkness that they're, re- they're walking in and responding in. But why does Jesus make this statement? Well, several weeks ago, we unpacked this in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is experiencing here total abandonment. He's been abandoned by his friends. He's been abandoned by his followers. Uh, Even last week, we saw in the text, we saw Simon of Cyrene helping Jesus carry the cross. It wasn't Simon Peter, the disciple. Uh, We saw that even the location of the cross, he's in Golgotha, a place outside of the city walls. But Jesus doesn't even talk about that abandonment. Jesus, he doesn't, notice he doesn't cry uh, when he's crucified on the cross. He doesn't talk about his physical pain. He doesn't say, my hands, my feet, my arms, my legs. Uh, No, rather he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, the most painful aspect of the cross wasn't the abandonment from his friends. It wasn't the humiliation. It wasn't even the physical pain. It was that he was forsaken at this moment by his father. And you notice the text. The father doesn't respond. He doesn't respond to Jesus' question. You even saw this earlier in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying to the father and he's asking the father, is there another way that you can remove this cup of wrath from me? The father doesn't respond respond. The father is silent. So the reason why the father is silent in both places and the reason why Jesus at this moment moment is abandoned by the father is because the father has now placed our sin upon his one and only son, upon his firstborn so that his firstborn would die for our sin. This was the plague that should have been placed on us, the plague that was now placed on Jesus. And this in the Bible is known as a theological term called substitutionary atonement. Is that Jesus became sin for us. This is why the Father could not look upon his Son, because Jesus absorbed our sin for us. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. The reformer, Martin Luther, called this passage, he calls uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 this, this idea, the great exchange, which means my sin goes to Jesus and Jesus' righteousness comes to me. The gospel, it could be summed up in in really two words, became and become. Jesus became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is known as, as really justification. We are now sinners made right before God. Why? Well, it can't be our own righteousness. It has to be the perfect sacrifice of of God's one and only son. This is what Jesus did when he died for us. This is why there was darkness that covered the land. Jesus went through the darkness for us so that we would be exposed to the light. But there's something else that happens at the cross where Jesus brings us out of darkness. Verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and he breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when Centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Now, what's the significance here of what Mark's trying to show us? Why does Mark suddenly take us to a different location? So here he is, is at Galgotha. 
He's outside of the city, and he's breathing his last breath. He cries out to the Father, why have you forsaken me? And then Mark takes us into the city, into Jerusalem, into the temple, and says, when that happened, when Jesus breathed his last breath, on the other side, into the temple, he says, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Of course, he's showing us from top to bottom because only God can do that, not, not bottom from top. It wasn't a man-made tear. It was God separating this curtain in the temple. Why did that happen? Why did that take place? Well, you think about it, this is happening again. Jesus' death is happening during the Passover. And the Passover, again, was a remembrance of God delivering his people out of exile and into freedom. And so here, every year, Israelites would remember God bringing uh, them out of exile. And every year, people would travel from all over. All these Jews would travel from all over the region into Jerusalem to the temple, and they would bring their sacrifices to the temple. They would go into the outer parts of the temple and they would maybe perhaps bring uh, a, sh- a, a, a lamb that would be slain or maybe it was something that they would sacrifice to God that would, that would be for their sin, to atone for their sin. And in the temple, no common man or woman was allowed into the temple. Only the high priest was allowed in the temple and only once a year during the Passover, the season that we're in right now that we're talking about in Mark's gospel, only once a year was the a, a high priest allowed into the deepest parts of the temple. And this was called the Holy of Holies. And it was separated even in the temple. So you think about the separation. Uh, man, man and woman could not come and enter into the temple this, because the temple was where the holiness of God, the presence of God would dwell. This is why God would be among his people through this physical building. And man and woman were not allowed in. But once a year during the Passover, the priest, the high priest, was allowed behind the curtain to commune with God and to be a mediator between God and man. Only once a year. If, if, a, if a high priest went behind the curtain in any other time, he would be struck dead, according to the law of Moses. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, Mark takes us over to the temple and says, by the way, this is what took place when Jesus breathed his last breath. The curtain, this four-inch curtain that separated uh, man from God, is torn from top to bottom. Why does he show us that? Mark is showing us that Jesus represented, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross would cover all sacrifices. When the curtain was ripped in two, God is saying this final sacrifice would end all sacrifices. No longer does man need to come before God to offer sacrifices in order to appease God or to forgive sin. No, Christ dying on the cross was enough. His single sacrifice was enough. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10 verse 14, for by a single offering, Christ's single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. One single offering was enough. The other thing he's trying to show us is that there's also no longer a mediator necessary between God and man because Christ is our mediator. We no longer need to go through this sacrificial system to try to earn God's favor, to try to uh, uh, relieve God's punishment towards sin. Now it's been done through Christ. Now we don't need a temple system. Uh, We don't need a physical priest. We have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who tore this curtain, this separation because of our sin, this separation from top to bottom. And not only that, but but the curtain torn in two shows us that it's not just for the Jews and ethnic people. It's an invitation for all to come. 
It's an invitation for the Jew. It's an invitation for the Gentile. It's an invitation for the male. It's an invitation for the female. It's an invitation for the free. It's an invitation to the slave. It's for invitation for all to come. And that's the gospel. That's what Mark is showing us, that even in the midst of darkness, there's a light and there's an invitation to come. The darkness has been overcome by the light of the gospel. Church, this is the God that we serve. There's this place in John's gospel where there's a woman who's caught in her darkness. She had committed the sin of adultery, and there's a mob of religious leaders, and they, they capture this woman, and they angrily bring her before Jesus. And they ask Jesus, what, are you, what, are you gonna, what should we do about this woman? They, they, they quoted the law of Moses to Jesus. They said, according to the law of Moses, we're supposed to stone this woman. We're supposed to kill this woman. And so they ask Jesus this, this important question, what do you say? And of course, they're trying to trap Jesus, hoping that Jesus would somehow contradict the scriptures. Now, notice what Jesus says in, in John 8, verse 7. He says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then verse 9, it says, and they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now that's verse 11. Now notice what he says in verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is what the light of Christ, this is what the light of the gospel does. It's an invitation for us to abandon the darkness to leave our shame, to leave our guilt, to leave our sin into a place where God looks at us and says, I, can, I condemn you not. Go and sin no more. Do you see the freedom in this invitation? That, that's the light that Jesus has shines upon us. The darkness, is in the darkness, it's, it's, it's the way that the woman was trying to be exploited by these religious leaders. They were trying to embarrass her and to shame her and her sin. The religious leaders wanted to shed the light of condemnation on this woman. But the light of Jesus, it invites her into freedom. It's a freedom that says, you don't have to stay in the darkness. You can actually see in front of you. You can actually have hope that even in your darkness, that you don't have to stay there. You don't have to let darkness destroy you or defeat you or condemn you. You can see in front of you, you have light. That's what Jesus is offering this woman. That's what Jesus offers us. Uh, you can see around you. You can trust people. You can receive love from people. You can actually learn to, to love others. Uh, you, can, you can look behind you. You can make sense of your past because the light of the gospel has been shined upon you. You're no longer in the darkness. John says it this way in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. It says, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Friends, the only way 
we can truly know God's love for us. And really, the only way we can receive and we can give love to one another is that we no longer walk in the darkness. That's what John's saying. Christ took on the plague of darkness for us so that we could walk in the light. And we, like this woman who's caught in the darkness, we could walk away free because we've been exposed to this grace, not this condemnation. We've been invited in to the mercy and love of Christ who went through the darkness for us. So there's two ways that you can look at this passage. One, you're going to look at it differently if you're a believer and a non-believer. So I want to unpack both of those things. Uh, First of all, if you're a believer in Christ, may this be an invitation for you to continue to walk in the freedom that Christ has given you. Um, Ephesians 5 verse 8, Paul says, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are uh, light in the Lord. Then he says, walk as children of light. And what he's talking about there is really holiness. He's saying continue to be open with your sin and continue to not hide. Uh, Continue to walk in repentance. Continue to believe that you are loved by God and that he has a plan for your life that you can see in front of you, that you can see around you, that you can see behind you, that you can make sense of all the things that are happening in your life. You can make sense that even in the season right now, you can even make sense of the suffering that you're going through even right now that he wouldn't call you out of the darkness and into the light and then put you back in the darkness. That's not the God that we serve. The hope of the gospel is that we can be light even in the world around us, even when the world around us is dark. And so this invitation for you, if you're walking as a children, a child of light, that he's not going to leave you that he's not going to put you back in the darkness, that he's going to be with you. And he's going to be with you always. And we're going to receive this grace and this mercy, and we'll be with him for eternity, forever. We'll enjoy him forever. This is the God that we serve. So may we live and may we walk as children of light. So that's the hope that we have. We're in Christ. But if you're not a Christian, there's an invitation for you here. As you read this gospel account, we read the holy words of Scripture. There's an invitation for you to abandon the darkness. God sent the plagues of Egypt to warn them and Pharaoh to repent. And one was complete darkness for three days. Well, Jesus went to the cross And darkness covered the whole land for three hours. And God is telling us these are the days to repent. As we're even even in a season of suffering, he's saying, hey, this world is not your home. We're not promised a better life now on this earth. But we are promised a better life in eternity with him. And so he's saying, as you see this world become more dark, may it be an invitation for you to experience the true light and the hope that we have in Christ. There's an invitation then that happens also in the story where you see the curtain that is torn from top to bottom. And he's saying, this is an invitation for you to be a child of the light. That you don't, it doesn't matter what race that you come from, doesn't matter what background you have or your family dynamics or uh, your socioeconomic background, anything, nothing is going to interfere from the freedom that you have in the light. And so this is a call as the curtain is torn from top to bottom. He's saying you have full access to the Father. You don't have to go through a priest, a physical human priest. You could come directly to God through Christ. And there's no level of darkness that can constrain this grace, that would withhold this grace, 
So as sinful as you believe that you are, there's an invitation for you to come. The curtain was torn so that you would have full access to this grace and that you would walk away like the woman who was caught in adultery and he looks at you and says, go and sin no more. So if you're not a believer, my hope is that you would see the darkness that Christ went through on your behalf when he died on your place for your sins. And my hope is that you would repent of your sins and that you would surrender to the Lord Jesus and that then you would walk away and you would go and sin no more. Not saying that you would live perfect, but you would have a posture of brokenness over your sin and you would have a desire to live for your king. And so may all of us in this season that we're in in now more than ever, may we as a church walk as children of light. God help us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the light of the world. Lord, as we even read John's gospel in the first chapter, it tells us that you were there in the beginning and that you came into the world as light in a dark place. And you came full of grace and of truth. And so God, I pray for for us to walk as children of light. I pray for those who are listening today and who are watching, who maybe are stuck in the darkness, or they see the grace and the mercy that you offer when the curtain was torn in two, and the invitation, because you went to darkness for us, we don't have to stay there, that we can live in the light. And we, you're, we know because of what your word tells us, there's freedom in the light. There's freedom then to love you more, and there's freedom to love others more, and to receive the love that you've given us. So God, will we receive that? Would we walk in the light? In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I invite you to respond to the gospel in three different ways. First, we're going to hear songs, and it's my hope that you would reflect on the words of these songs, and there would be an encouragement for you during this time to walk as children of light. Secondly, I'm going to invite you to give sacrificially and generously. If you're listening, uh, we just want to let you know we don't we don't want your money. We're just glad that you're listening, and we hope that this could be an encouragement for you. Perhaps you want to know more about uh, our church or about how to become a believer in Christ. My hope is you would go to our website, go to our COVID-19 uh, page, and let us know if you need anything. We'd love to care for you in any way that we can. But if you call Integrity Church your home, we're going to invite you to give. Uh, during this season, uh, it's an important time for us to give sacrificially and generously. We don't want to quarantine the gospel. Uh, we want to make sure the gospel continues to, to, to reach people, uh, even through online, and we can continue to make disciples. We can continue to spread the word through sending out missions and sending out church plants. We want to continue to do those things. So I want to invite you to give. Um, if you have the means to do so, uh, for those of you who are working and have jobs, uh, please give so that the gospel will continue to go forward here in Greenville and throughout the world through the mission of Integrity Church. The last thing I'm going to invite you to do is take of the Lord's Supper. Perhaps you're at home and you have some of those elements of bread and wine or juice. Uh, May you take the bread and the bread would help you remember the body of Christ that was broken for you on the cross. You'll take the bread and then you'll then dip it into the cup and the cup will be uh, remembrance of the blood that Jesus has shed. And this is for you if you are in Christ to remember uh, that you are a child of the light. And so it's a chance for you to repent Uh, maybe sins in your life, maybe you're stuck in the darkness and you need a reminder of Christ's love for you. And as you repent, as you walk in repentance today, may you take the bread and take the cup as a remembrance of Christ calling us out of the darkness and into the light as he absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. Integrity Church, even in this season, we have much to celebrate. We can walk as children in the light.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today, church. Thanks for tuning in and worshiping even from your living rooms. Our hope is that today you'll be able to leave encouraged by the gospel and reminded of the great love that the Father has for us in his Son. So as we leave, I want to point you to two different things. Uh, I want to remind you that even though we're not gathering physically and you're not able to uh, give physically, there's still ways to give with our app, with our website, or with mailing and checks. And I also want to point you to the Mature and Multiply podcast that we started putting out. So every Tuesday and every Thursday, Ben has been recording and publishing a podcast as he's working through the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter is all about a people who are in exile, people who are sort of alienated and they feel alone and separated. And it's very similar to our current situation. So with that podcast, our goal and our hope and our prayer is that it can be an encouragement to you throughout the week. It's just short 10-minute episodes. You can tune in and be encouraged by the Word of God. So I want to invite you to check that out on Apple Podcasts or on our Podbean website. Again, thank you so much for worshiping with us. We pray that you have a great week. Even separated from one another, we can still leave encouraged by the Word of God.